I'd like to start with embedding videos and five key beliefs. Believe it or not, the five key beliefs that I wanted to share with you are from a blogger, uh, Dave Stewart Jr., who writes about the five key beliefs of student motivation. Um, and you can subscribe to his bi-weekly newsletter. He's going on hiatus now because he teaches in middle school and high school. Um, but I was so in admiration of his work that I did my last master's project on it for my independent study. Um, so I'll find you his site. Um, and I'm not even gonna drill down because this is a great screenshot. So the five key beliefs that he believes uh, comprise student motivation are the credibility of the instructor, the value and relevance of the work to the student, whether they feel like they belong in the space. Do I belong in this classroom with these people? Do I belong in this town? Do I belong in this subject area? You know, in higher education, we have students who choose a narrow path. It's not like, you know, middle school and high school where they can do well in some subjects and not in others. They've chosen a path. Are they in education? Are they in psychology? Are they in environmental studies? And if they start to believe that they don't belong in that field or in Antioch as an institution, maybe because uh, our value system is different or something like that, those things can affect how motivated they are to continue. Um, effort. This one is also talked about as growth mindset. Um, Carol Dweck wrote a book called Mindset. Um, if a student doesn't believe that they can achieve through effort, or if they feel the student, the faculty or instructor doesn't believe they can achieve and get better through effort, they can just totally fall off that motivation cliff. I call it clogging up your motivator, okay? So if, um, if this work doesn't seem to matter or be relevant to me, it can clog up your motivator. Um, and lastly, efficacy. Can I succeed? Can I complete this class? Can I complete this program? Um, all of those factors, and as you know, our students are facing, and we are facing all of these now, especially relevance. Is this relevant to my life right now during COVID? Do I need to put this on pause to do something else? How much focus can I put on this? Do I have other things in my life that are more important at the moment? And those can be very temporary or they can be longstanding. Um, but for me, that has really driven me to change and look at what's important to me is these five key uh, motivators. So what I did is I found uh, Dave Stewart Jr. doing a TEDx talk on this topic and I want to embed it in my Sakai site. And it's a YouTube video so it's super easy. You simply go to the share button and you click copy the URL and in your Sakai page let me just get there to my Sakai site. This is my sample site. So there are two issues. If you have a video and you wanna post it on your overview, it's difficult to do compared to doing it on one of these lessons pages, all right? If you have a lessons page, a lessons page has all of these tools to add content and specifically this quick and easy one. So this is the quick and easy way. If you're putting it on a lessons page, you come in here, you can click embed content on the page 
you add the URL and you click save. This recording will be available. We actually have a micro recording on how to do this. Um, and you will see right down here at the bottom, here's Dave's video embedded in the last location on my page because that's where it lands. I can move it around. But it was literally three steps. Copy the link, click the embed button and paste the URL. Now that's great if you want it on a lessons page, but if you had created like an interview, um, the only way to put it on the overview page, or let's just say in a forum post is with the embed code. And this is a little tricky. So I'm always here to help you do this, especially the first time. Don't feel you have to do it on your own. But if you have a video that's on TEDx or that's not on YouTube, most video tools will also be able to give you the embed code. So if you're on TED, you click share and it says, do you want the link or do you want the embed code? If you copy this embed code instead of the link, this is the geeky way. But it's also the workaround that works for almost all video types when you don't have a YouTube or Vimeo video. So if you get the embed code and you go back to a page that doesn't have this ad content, embed content, like the overview, and you want to insert it at the top of this page, let's just say right here, there's a scary, so first I clicked edit to get into the edit window. And now I'm gonna click this source button. Can you see where my mouse is? Mm -hmm. This source button, it's gonna open the code. You don't need to know anything, just about finding some white space and pasting in the, the embed code. So that's the exact code that we took off of the page. We'll come down here and hit update options. And there you go, your video's embedded. All right, questions. That was two ways to do something in about a minute and a half. Do you have to put, is it, do, I don't know HTML code well enough to know. Do you have to put two spaces in between your HTML code that you just put in and no, the you do thing not. that you're pasting in. You don't need to, but I like to in case I need to go back in there and read it. So it's on oh, the yeah. okay. when you have to go back and look at the source, it's a little neater, so you okay. can find it. Sometimes those paragraphs of code get really long, but they all touch each other and and they condense into one paragraph. I like okay. some space. The spaces do not add spaces to the page. Thank you. That's a okay. good thing to know. But it, the, the little, um, what, what do you call the, 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 the pointers left, the pointers right? What are they called? Uh, they are the, we call them greater than, less than, but they're, they the, they're tags. Yeah. Less everything than or contained, more than? Everything contained between them is a tag. Is a tag. Okay, so so if I put less than p and more than then that gives me a space it does but it's easier just to leave the source and uh -huh. come in here ah and just add a return very good thank you so you can put some more spaces between whatever you want out here outside of the source code thank you um, that's what i needed to know thank you if anybody happens to know a little html feel free to use the source muck around in there but I only say this is the, the back end way when a video is being difficult and you can't get it to go in the kind of location that you want. So for example, if you wanted students to watch a video right before they replied to a forum and you went into your forum discussions and you wanted to embed a video right here in the instructions, it's still an editor box. Again, you can go into the source and you can put it at the top, at the bottom, you can put it where you want it. You can paste in that embed code and you can leave the source. You will get this little iframe thing until you save it. But anywhere that you don't have that add content tool and you wanted to add it the easy way, 
you can always come in here and add it the slightly less easy way. <laughs> All right, and then you just hit save. And then when people look at your discussion topic, that video is embedded right there and they can watch it. And then your discussion questions are right there and they can reply. So you can do something like that. Excellent. Um, okay. I just had a quick question. So that, um, does this mean that essentially in, in those edit boxes, there is no option to just insert a video? Um, there is an option, well, to insert an object, but Sakai isn't a streaming server. Hmm. So what you don't wanna do is have students or, or faculty putting videos into Sakai, like in the resources and then linking to them in mm -hmm. anywhere because mm -hmm. Sakai will, A, it'll take, it may time out before the full video uploads. So it's best to store your video on Google Drive, YouTube, um, on some shared server that is a streaming server that does playback really, really well, and then just link to it or embed it here. So when you're embedding, you're really just embedding the code to make it look like the videos in Sakai, yeah. but it's really still in YouTube. You're just watching it in the Sakai window. We could also just post a link. I'm used to, sorry, I'm just used to Canvas where if I put the link in there, it'll automatically like embed it or I can click add video and then put the link and then it embeds it. But there's essentially no way to do that unless you're in that other page where you do add content or you have to do HTML. Is that correct? Yes. So okay. Canvas has an embedded video management system. So it has a whole mm -hmm. library of the videos that you can link to. And it's usually stored on a streaming server. Now we're right. currently investigating Kaltura, um, Warpwire and, um, one of the other Penopto as video streaming services that'll allow us to integrate this a little bit better with Sakai. But mm. for right now, embedding is the quickest and easiest way to do that. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I did recently find, and this is uh, new for me, anytime you're in one of these editing windows, there is a tool right here and I've already thought of it as a scepter and I didn't know what it did. I didn't need it, so I didn't use it but it allows you to record an audio clip that attaches right to your text block here. So if I hit um, start recording, at first it asks you if you want to allow to use your mic. I could start recording, stop recording, hit post recording, and it'll put a little link to the audio right in there and they could hear my voice talking. You can't edit it but this would allow students to reply with an audio to your forum discussion instead of typing up their response right embedded in Sakai. And in later versions, um, if we can get an add-on to CK Editor or if we get Kaltura, there would be a video reply box in here where they could also reply with a video right in the stream with their um, forum discussion as well. So that may be coming uh, soon, coming down the pike. So I can put a little voice in there and say, wake up. <laughs> you can, and if they click the link, then they will hear it, <laughs> but it doesn't automatically play. <laughs> so so that's, that's a little bonus. While we're here, did anybody have any uh, related questions? Uh, kind of quick side question, but if you did do that with the, um, had them record the voice, would you say that that's easier to grade in the discussions than using like voice thread to have them do a voice discussion? Um, I'm going to, I would have to let Abby Johnson, uh, say about how okay. easy it is to grade voice thread. So with this, um, you would be instead of reading it, you would just click the play button and you would listen to their response. Mm -hmm. And then when you went into the forums to grade them, uh, there isn't, as far as I know, a text transcript of the response. So you'd probably have to grade them relatively af soon after you listen to them or like make a note on a piece of paper about what their grade should be because you don't have a way of going back to look at it again without playing, without playing mm -hmm. it again. Mm -hmm. With VoiceThread, VoiceThread is really great at supporting <laughs> 
a more nuanced and a more complex discussion of a, uh, a piece of media like a short video or um, a flyer or your syllabus or a PDF um, because people can reply in audio, video or text on that one document. So if you have a more complex discussion, question and answer, um, voice thread might be the way to go. And if you have a simple, a person is going to reply to a form thread and let's say for example, they broke their arm and can't type, <laughs> They have an option to submit their post, or let's just say they have every other assignment in your class is a typed written assignment and you want to allow them some variety, they can use this audio. Janet mm -hmm. Robertson's a faculty member at AUNE and she allows her students, instead of posting individually as a reply, you can get together with one or two other students in Zoom, record your conversation and just post the link to the cloud as your response, your post and your response for that week. For students who are maybe better at discussing or want some more active learning to engage with other students in the class versus another, I'm sitting alone in my house typing another post into um, my required forum topics. And Is I think- Is VoiceThread on Sakai? Yes, VoiceThread's available. And if you want to set it up on your Sakai, um, Abby mm -hmm. Johnson can help you get an account and link it to your course. Okay. Um, just email at at antioch.edu and ask for help setting up VoiceThread and Abby will jump right on that. She came to us from um, a couple of colleges in New York, one where she's still an adjunct, and she came with ready knowledge of VoiceThread. So we have really taken that and run with it. And she's just really our lead um, instructional designer on that because there's a lot of pedagogy involved and she has a lot of experience with that and can help with the pedagogy um, in addition to the technical implementation. Okay. So I'm going back to look at and I don't know if you guys know about this, but if I accidentally close this tab, both browsers that I know, Firefox and Chrome, maybe even Safari have this secret tip. If you right click the toolbar, you can reopen closed tabs. So if you ever close a couple of tabs and then you're like, oh, where'd that tab go? I can't find it. Um, it's sh control shift T, I use the right click in and select it but your tab comes right back where it was. Sorry, I'll pause it. And um, you can see if you lost any tabs um, and it even opened up on my other window that I have the same browser in. So uh, a faculty member taught me that. I shared something with her and she shared this, she showed me how to do this. So just so you know, <laughs> we're all learning things every day. There's, there's too much out there for all of us to have to know it all at the same time. Um, so, all right, I wanna jump back to my poll everywhere. And an easy way to make PDFs accessible in two minutes. Um, Please. Yes. <laughs> All right. So there's an exciting new tool on our uh, horizon. Uh, it's called Census Access. And I have the link to it right here. I'm going to open it in a new tab. Census Access is a tool we are in the process of purchasing, and it um, can go right in, it will go right in all of our Sakai courses, and it will allow you or your students to convert a file in the moment mm, within, you know, 10 minutes or an hour or so um, to whatever file format that they might need. They can convert a PDF to an MP3 so that they can listen to it. They can convert a PDF to an accessible Word document. Um, and it's super easy to use. For right now, until we get it implemented in Sakai, 
we all of you can go to this web page so steal this url i'm putting it in the chat and use it at will to convert any pdfs that you might have that might not be fully accessible um for example uh, i'm going to go back to my website here i'm going to cancel these changes I'm going to go to my resources folder to see if I have some PDFs in there. Um, I have some on my desktop. So all you have to do to use census access is submit a file via and attaching it to this page, a URL, or you can copy and paste text right into here. I'll show you, for example, um, I have some PDFs in my local folder here. Um, All right, here's the syllabus. All I did was select it. I will hit the upload button and it's gonna ask me two questions. What output format do you want? MP3 audio, braille, ebook or accessibility conversion. I almost always do accessibility conversion. And then it asks me what file type I want. Do I want it as a Word doc? or a PDF, or an Excel, or a CSV. Um, I tend to choose PDF, but if you need to be able to manipulate the text, a Word document's a great option. Unless so, you have Adobe, Adobe um, Pro. PDF Pro, which I do. Right. <laughs> so then you just give them your email address and you hit submit. Um, and in, in, in my experience, it has taken two to three minutes to get back these five page PDFs. Um, and I'll see if they, how quickly they come back in my email and I'll let you know when they do. Um, but the real issue with PDFs is if they are um, a text-based PDF or not. Um, so, for example, in this PDF, there are background colors, there are images, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Down here, there are te is text. And if you don't know if your PDF is accessible or not, if you can highlight just a few words, that means these words are text and an audio reader can read them aloud. Wow. But if you have a scanned, like open page photocopy of a book and you see the page creases on the left and you see that crease down the middle in the photocopy, that is just a picture of that two page spread of the book and you can't highlight the text. What Census Access does is it reads that document and it uses OCR technology to scan the text and change it to a text readable, accessible PDF. And it does all the things like tagging it in the background so that any accessible reader can then speak it aloud. It saves your pagination, it saves the images, it still looks the way it came through for the most part. It will usually hide any of those photocopy or artifacts so that it's on a nice crisp white background with just the letters and you don't get all those black marks from the photocopier makes it so much easier to read for people um, so you can use the census access url and you can even upload multiple files at once um, i have just received the return file from census access in my email. That didn't take long at all. It attaches it right here. 
and you can open it to preview it. And um, it uh, gives you some text. So in this case, it was converted to its original format PDF. I simply download it to my desktop, rename it, and put it back in my resources folder and it's ready to go. All right. I have a question. I did the raise my hand thing, but I'm not sure if oh. you can see it. Yes, go ahead. I, I couldn't see it on your white background. Oh. Not um, your phone. <laughs> oh. Um, sorry, I'll lower it now. Is it all that glare? <laughs> yeah, it, it's just the sometimes, depending on what your background looks like, you can't see it against whatever's up in that corner where it places it. Sure, no problem. Um, so is this, uh, this, is, this is great. I can think of a lot of ways this would be valuable. I know that one of the major, uh, it's a two part question, um, is that one of the major problems most of us have been suffering since the pandemic and moving online is the need for students and or faculty staff to sign PDFs. And students and some faculty are struggling on how to do that. I mean, I do it in preview, I'm on a Mac, but I've also used Adobe to do it. Um, but I, I, there were people I have tried to help show how they can do it and it's, it's so this, does this address that in any way, this program? It does not. Okay. Um, so it would be actual Adobe Pro or Adobe eSign that would allow you to do that. However, I will say I have recently forwarded, uh, a couple of vendors have come forward. They offer to help colleges and universities with their eSign technology and provide it to everyone. It's been a huge boon during COVID. It's not something we've been able to, uh, to, you know, that's IT versus AT. But I know that Jeannie Grippo, who's the director of IT, um, would be happy to hear if people are struggling with that and if we need to adopt a university-wide solution for e-signing PDFs. It's probably more of an issue for staff yeah. than it is for faculty, but faculty still have to sign them all the time, yeah. right? I mean, I'm interacting <laughs> with them every day between all of the departments that I support, either a student and a faculty or a faculty, I'm doing you know, licensing docs and credit transfers and blah, 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 and they all require a signature. And the university's been, I'm putting air quotes around kind for the last year and a half in that Reg and Student Services has been willing to have emails come in that they then have to find and read to process something. And I'm like, let's make this signable yeah. Um, the number of emails that I've had to forward, and then I don't know how they can even keep track of them. So I, I will reach out to Jean. So thank you for answering that question. Let's um, do that. And if you are comfortable doing it, or if you know some people who are good with eSign technology, let me know, and I'll try to produce a tutorial video for people and share it on our site so that other people can learn how to do it or who to talk to if, if they need some help in the meantime, before we get something site-wide now. Monica, using, yep. using like preview or Adobe, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, whatever, I, I, whatever you have access to and you use, yeah. we can show that as an example for okay. how people can do it. I'll reach out to you about that because I'd be happy to do that. My second question is about this um, software. Um, can I hang on for a sec? Um, yeah. Monica, was your question related to her first question? It is actually, and it may not, um, okay. with, uh, we were having that issue in HR just because, again, we collect what's called a position funding authorization form. It's a fillable form, and also an employee action form, you know, all those forms, payroll related. And I, I mean, me being the sole, each HR representative, we have to collect all those documents every quarter, obviously, to set up and pay faculty and whatnot. So that form, I mean, I just an example, I get like about sometimes total of 50 or 60 EAFs, employee action forms, that the provost has to sign, the vice chancellor has to sign, finance has to sign. So the same, and then once it's saved, somebody can 
edited. And so right. working on one form in particular and to utilize workflow so that it gives that formal process. So that's, that's what made me think of what, you know, to kind of what she was mentioning. I know, I'm, like, as I mentioned, not that I have to be faculty, but just how tedious these forms and like saving, oh. saving, upload, download. I mean, again, imagine me at the beginning of a quarter, I have over two, 300 of, from all the different programs coming in, all our each HR represented by each campus to kind of, you know, get these forms signed. And it's, it's very frustrating. And I will say it's very, um, you know, we all have better things to do than me trying to edit and sign a form, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. And so you're it's using workflow? Monica, are you actually using workflow or are you? They just, they just tested it. Randy uh, do, was doing a test for the HR team to... So we're starting that process just with that one particular form. Um, and then hopefully moving forward that, you know, we can all do that, um, you know, make it more efficient, obviously. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've heard about the workflow thing and I was actually, we remember we, Bonnie, we were in a meeting with Jamie Green and what I ran up against and I totally understand it was they wanted to build these if the same thing would be used across every campus. And, you know, until we have, things more centralized. I mean, a lot are, but there are like transfer credits that's not centralized. And so I think workflow is from what I understand and it's minimal from my experience, my understanding is minimal, is that workflow will eventually be a great solution. But um, if there is some, and again, I'll reach out to Jeannie, if there is some uh, software we can use for quick signatures, because uh, what Monica is saying is, uh, I'm constantly getting something back. And then the chair says, it won't let me sign it because when I signed it, then it locked it. Mm -hmm. And um, and it doesn't, anyway, I won't go down that rabbit hole and waste our time, but it, it is a significant time suck for many of us. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I had to fill it out and I had to sign it and then save the signed copy, send it to my boss who had to sign, e-sign it and send a saved copy and send it to Terry to sign it and save an e-copy and send it back to HR. And those things just take the number of steps. And for everybody who doesn't know what workflow is, workflow is a part of Colleague that allows you to make interactive processes online versus these paper forms that you e-sign and have to email to each other. And they can do various things, you know, to be built, but it's out there. I believe we could also use uh, COVID CARES money, HERF, yeah. HERF money for this. So if anybody emails Jeannie about that, Got it. suggest that maybe, oh, and talk root in um, Terry Ratcliffe, because he, I think, is the lead for the HERF money, um, and Got say it. this would be a great thing to do. It will help our students who have to sign forms. It'll help our staff and faculty who have to sign forms. Um, Absolutely. And, and let's do it now. <laughs> so um, thank you for that. That's, and I will do that. I will um, send that email. The, the second question that I had wanted to bring up about this is this tool of, of turning PDFs into Word documents on through Sakai. Is that available to students and the instructor or just the instructors? So it will be visible to students and instructors and academic staff in every Sakai course. Mm -hmm. And we all can use this link that I just gave you to do it for, to, for items that are not already in Sakai. So the, the LTI tool in Sakai will allow you to pick any file that's in that Sakai course, click on it and tell it which, uh, what format, format you want it to, be, to come out as. So um, here's a question I have. Um, this is not a um, backdoor um, what we were talking about, Bonnie. But I'm aware of, of a situation where a student asked for a syllabus in Word and then edited it and then used it to try and document that they did what they were supposed to be doing versus, and it took a ton of time to find and prove what was the original version that had been loaded. And, oh, my God. Um, and so I know that that's a concern. I mean, there's other concerns about changing content that's owned by like, you know, the faculty, a syllabus and whatnot. So 
this has me concerned in, and this isn't anything you can solve, but I was, I was just wondering if this was going to allow students to access documents and turn them into Word documents. I can see the value of it for certain things, but I, 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 so I hear what you're do. saying. So I think the workaround is this, the PDF that is posted by the faculty member on the syllabus page of Sakai is the official PDF. I have to Anything else? Bonnie, Bonnie, I have to interrupt you because I was forced to put my syllabus into DocX, which I did not want to do right. by somebody. The and um, I preferred it to be in PDF. I mm -hmm. actually, just because I like PDF, I hate everything Microsoft, so just my personal thing. But um, uh, I was forced to put it in DocX and I think it's probably, it has to be from the top because I, the person who made me do it was not a, an official you know, superior, but so I did, but I would prefer it to be in PDF in the master and I was forced to put it in DocX. So just so you know. Yeah, so, I just learned that from our faculty. It came from above because students were frustrated that they couldn't edit it and they wanted to make changes to like mark things and highlight and whatever. And the faculty didn't really have a say in it. And um, there is strong concern about the fact that it's editable now. Well, I think that should be in the master. So we can go, we have that. Yeah. Well, you can't, okay. So they can download a copy. They can edit a copy. They cannot change what is uploaded on the syllabus page. Right. So what that is our master. And I agree with you all. I, we in AT recommend it should be a PDF. Mm -hmm. PDF are more accessible, easier to use with e-readers. Um, they don't have that docx thing and I think this is something that should be probably taken up with the chairs of your departments and or brought to the faculty senate the, uh, the faculty board to say nope here's some real reasons why they should at least start out as a pdf yeah okay but, well I just wanted to know thank you that is the exact reason why we ask that all faculty put their syllabus in the Sakai course, even if they're face-to-face -face classes, because it is a place that documents the official syllabus for the course and that only the instructor um, or, you know, their academic support people could change on their behalf. Right. Um, it, it documents your what you've set out as a contract from the students, and you always have that to compare to anything a student might bring to you Right. that they might have tweet you know in these very odd not very frequent situations but to protect that thank you michelle that's really interesting <laughs> my goodness yeah and, and you know the problem with i i mean it's great and i i wasn't really concretizing that the master would still be okay in sakai but things can get down the email rabbit hole before anyone has thought is this actually the accurate? You know, no one thinks it, it isn't until someone says, well, wait a minute, I went to Sakai and looked, this isn't the same, yeah. you know? So, um, and sometimes you've gone down a rabbit hole and then of course people want to make it go away. So people are happy. And so, right. Yeah. I'll All start. right. So we've got 10 minutes and I want to take the opportunity to See if anybody has anything urgent that they want to ask about, or if we should continue on to talking about briefly about polling tools, search tips for Google, um, and maybe I will show you that secret tip about Chrome while my web browser is up. Yeah. Anybody have anything urgent they'd like to put on the docket? Go ahead, Meg. Secret tip about Chrome, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So Google Chrome and even Firefox and Microsoft Edge, they now have an account that is attached to your web browser that allows you to open a web browser like Chrome on multiple devices and it saves your bookmarks and your settings if you are logged in to Chrome. So I'm just gonna pull up my annotation tool and you eyes are all viewing my screen. So let me, they're under the view options at the top of your screen where it says you're seeing Bonnie's screen. There are some annotation tools. 
that you can turn on. It says annotate. Feel free to annotate this screen um, and practice with that. I have turned on my annotate tools so that I can point to this little face up here that's generic. That tells me that I have not logged into my Google Chrome account to sync my Google Chrome across all my devices. And I have that turned off because I have a personal Gmail account, three personal <laughs> Gmail accounts and an Antioch <laughs> Gmail account. I have a uh, YouTube and you know all of your accounts that are connected to your Google account. My Evernote account is linked to my Google account. My YouTube account is linked to my. So sometimes your browser get confused when your Chrome account is logged into your personal account and your AU Direct is logged into your Antioch account and it still pulls up Zoom as your personal account or pulls up YouTube as your personal account. So what I have done is in I have to turn on my mouse again. In this three dots menu under settings, Marianne's annotating. We've got someone annotating with some gold stars. Bring it on, keep practicing. Under sync and Google services, I'm gonna clear all of the um, annotations, but put some more on. Um, I have disallowed Chrome sign-in. And Monica, was it you or was it Whitney that brought this up? You mean like for me, it was just handling multiple Gmail accounts. Yeah. I have the payroll, the HR, and then my Monica. And I was, I'm a nerd. I was creating Gmail lists in one and then I couldn't, you know, anyways, that's a separate. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I, have, I have to mess with it, not mess with it, but, you know, work with it and try to yeah. just understand it better, really. Yeah. So we understand this, that technical term to mess with it. We really do. <laughs> um, so if if you can disallow Chrome sign in, it can cause the accidental confusion where Chrome doesn't know who you are all the time, where it thinks you're your personal and your Antioch account at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I disallow sign in. And then I always make sure that my um, this is just this generic white circle with the gray uh, head and shoulders in it. Um, that means there's not going to be any confusion. But I also have my B Powers account and my AT account. Um, and those have Google groups linked to them. They have YouTube channels linked to them. So what I have, what I do is by default, my use my Chrome browser for my B Powers account. And then I use Firefox for my AT at Antioch.edu account. And so when I log in, I log into AU Direct. And when I need to do something from my AT account, I open Firefox and um, it's just taking a second. And there are two ways if you have multiple Antioch accounts. You can have a delegated account. Uh, while this is loading, I'll show you my delegated account. If you are in, oops, I meant to bring up my Gmail tab. If you're in Gmail, if your account is delegated to you, you don't have the ID and password to that account. Your email has just been delegated so that you can go look at the email box for all of these accounts that you belong to. But what I do with my Antioch Zoom account is I log in with the ID and password of my AT account, my academic technology account. And then I actually am that user in Firefox. And then I leave, I'm still B powers over in Chrome. And if you have Safari and you have a third account, you can use a third browser. So that is one way to do it. Um, and now that I'm here, if I go into YouTube, which is owned by Google, you will see that the first time it takes a second, it's gonna load. It doesn't know who I am up here. And now voila, it knows that I am, um, it knows that I'm AUAT now and not B powers. That profile in the corner is probably the most important thing to look at when you're in Zoom 
when you're in YouTube, when you're in uh, Google groups, um, whenever you're doing things with your multiple accounts. And uh, Monica, you and I can look at like your specific usage if you want to try to find additional ways that we can give you more ways because you seem to be more than two different people. <laughs> you're <laughs> acting as three or four different people, which further complicates the issue. Has anybody else had related trouble where they're logged into the wrong Zoom account or something like that? It's the Gmail actually on my phone that is trying to get into my mail in Antioch, it, I, ha I have to keep, uh, you know, oh, wait, I got to get out of uh, my personal G Gmail. Yeah. Get oh, wait, no, I'm still in my, my other, my Mac <laughs> mail. I got to get yeah. out of, I got, you know, and I'm, I have to work hard. It also doesn't seem to have all of the. Um, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. So <laughs> it just doesn't have like the, the nice picture and my little sayings at the bottom. It just doesn't do that. The, it, it can do some of those things, but the features are very limited in the Gmail okay. app. So right, that's good I would, know. I would show you my phone if it was easy, but I have two separate mail apps. I have the blue iPhone mail. That's where my personal Gmail account is set up. Okay. And I have the Gmail app and that's where my work Gmail is set up. So I only have to look at, I have two apps. If I want, if it's the weekend and I'm just looking at my personal email, right. I don't have to log in and out of it. It's set up. So it's only for my personal email account and the separate app. So there are several different mail apps that you could use to separate your accounts on your phone. What is this weekend you talk about? <laughs> what is this weekend? <laughs> You mean when you got my email at 11.30 the other night, you were wondering why I, I responded was right away? You mean that? <laughs> yeah, right. I work on a 24-hour schedule because my yeah. students are all over the world. <laughs> yeah, that has, COVID has sort of driven that in all of us. I guess so. I mean, I've been doing it for 20 years, so I, I, it's normal for me, but it's just strange because I really, everyone says weekend and I really do go, what is that? <laughs> what is that? Yes, yeah, the, the five day work week is, uh, or it, it's never Monday through Friday doesn't mean as much as it used to. All right, so I have two I minutes it never, it never, it to share about polling tools. Um, does anybody have a specific question for something I could go over that would be helpful? We used poll everywhere today. Uh, yes, it is my favorite tool only based on the fact of its free feature set. Hmm. Okay. So if I'm in my poll everywhere account for, it's a free account for students, for faculty, students don't even have to have an account to fill out one of your polls, but it has the most variability in the number of question types. So if I create a new activity, multiple choice, word cloud, Q and A, clickable image, which is like, hey, everybody, where are you in the world? Oh, Surveys, wow. open-ended, there's quiz competitions, and there are many more. We are using Upvote, which allows your participants to suggest an idea and upvote and downvote other ideas of other participants. So this is why I like Poll Everywhere. And the limit to, it's because the limitation on the free account is that you can have 40 participants in any one of your polls. You can have unlimited polls, unlimited different types of questions. The only limitation is that only 40 people can answer each poll. Most of our classes are smaller than that. Most of my meetings are smaller than that. So that's a limitation I can live with. Um, other tools have maybe some slightly better functionality, but they only limit you to two questions per presentation. Mentimeter, I love Mentimeter even more than Poll Everywhere but I can only have two interactive questions in each presentation. And so um, that means I have to build multiple presentations and skip to the next presentation if I have more than two polling questions per class. But it works great because uh, with Mentimeter, you can incorporate text and graphic-based slides and then slot your polls right into that presentation. So it's like having Google Slides and a polling tool in the same place. That's the one downfall of Poll Everywhere 
is you can't just put up a text slide followed by an activity slide, followed by, you know, a, a chart, followed by, you know, some more presentation slides and then another activity slide later. It doesn't have that, that presentation slides feature that Mentimeter has. But Mentimeter's business model is that you can only have two interactive slides. So depending on how you're gonna use a polling tool, that's how you pick. Let me lastly mention Zoom's polling tool. The only reason I don't, I don't not recommend it, but it only has multiple choice questions and there's no way to put other and allow people to type something in except for to tell them to type it in the chat. So if you just have a, hey, how's everybody feeling today? Do you wanna vote on your favorite flavor of ice cream? Straightforward polling questions with multiple choice answers, use Zoom, it's simple, it's integrated, it's built in, no additional accounts, you can show them right on your Zoom screen. But if you need anything other than a multiple choice tool, decide whether you want Mentimeter, which is interactive slides built into your all of your presentation slides, or Poll Everywhere, which is just the interactive slides, but allows you a lot more slides, a little, on many question types and many respondents. Mentimeter has unlimited respondents. If you have, you have a meeting of 100 people, Mentimeter is the way to go. But if you have a class of 40 or less, then I think uh, Poll Everywhere is the way to go.